Today, I'd like to welcome Rich Maltzman and Jim Stewart to the podcast. Uh, they've come to talk about their um, short title of a book, um, How to Facilitate Project, Productive Project Planning Meetings, A Practical Guide to Ensuring Project Success. And I'm trying not to be rude. It was Rich who poked fun at the length of his own meeting, uh, as if his own uh, book. Um, Rich is a, a master lecturer in Boston University, uh, creating and delivering courses at graduate level in project management and qualitative and quantitative decision making. Uh, he's also, also a co-founder of EarthPM uh, LLC, Integrating Sustainability uh, into Project Management, uh, has been in the project industry for 40 years, oh, sorry, in the industry for 40 years, of which only 30 of them are, are project uh, management related, and has been author of a number of books. And Jim is a project manager of well, over 25 years um, and has been independently consulting since 2003. Uh, is a PMP since 2001 and uh, an Agile coach and certified Scrum Master. Um, and uh, they both co-authored this uh, book and they've come to talk about something that all of us get involved with in project management in these beautiful kickoff, start-off project management meetings. And um, yeah, guys, thanks. Thanks for coming to the show. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting us. So um, I'll give you those little intros. Rich, do you want to just give a little bit more background on you there and uh, what you're up to and where, where you are and things like sure. that? Yeah, the so uh, lovely place. the um, background is semi-real. Uh, this is uh, Dennis, Massachusetts, um, and that's a photo I took of a nice sunset here on Cape Cod. And for those of you not familiar with ge geography, and since we have video here, I can draw a map of Cape Cod for you right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're on the muscle of Cape Cod. So that's a view of Cape Cod Bay. Uh, I have, I'm not going to spend much more time on the introduction other than to say the 40 years uh, of experience were in the telecom business, uh, deploying uh, telecom equipment in, in mostly. Um, and uh, so a lot of my experience is kind of hard, <laughs> hard earned in uh, turning up networks for companies like Verizon, Deutsche Telekom, Singtel, China Telecom, and so forth. But I've always also had a passion for teaching, and I've been doing that in parallel. That's 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 it. I I hand it back to Jim to have him uh, further uh, so, embellish uh, his. Okay, thanks, Rich. Um, uh, yeah, I'm Rich, and I have probably live about 15 minutes from each other. Not the Cape, but he lives north of Boston. We both do. I'm um, in fact going down the Cape uh, next week. It's very popular around here. It was in, we go down there, we lie on the beach, we go for clams, we play miniature golf, and we do that again. So that's pretty much the Cape. So I've been doing project management for a long time and I came out of IT as a network engineer. But since I've been independent in 2003, I've also done a fair amount of pharmaceutical at a company that both Rich and I worked at or at least consulted to and some financial. And I, I do a lot of a uh, fair amount of project management office setup. I'm working on now in the DC area all remotely. I've worked remotely since COVID or even before it. I just applied today for a cryptocurrency. There's a lot of cryptocurrency work happening, a lot of Bitcoin work happening. So there's a project that may get involved in there. Um, I teach like Rich. Uh, I've subbed for him sometimes. We've worked on writing questions for PMP material before. That's how we met, was working on PMP material. And I guess the other ways you can distinguish Rich from I is I've, I have quite a bit more certifications than he does and a lot more hair. Other than that, pretty I think much. There's a relationship. There, perhaps. <laughs> it must mean I'm losing certifications by the moment. By the moment. But Thanks. he is a he is a Cleveland Book Award winner. He's humble about that, but he has won an award for his Green Project Management book. Yes, eleven years ago now, but yes. Oh, well, that's us. Brilliant. That's Thank us. you, so much, guys. So obviously, we're, we're talking about um, your new book, um, and as you as in your in the intro and in your. Your own poking fun, Rich. You said it's quite a long title on it. It's um, what? Why did what? What inspired you guys to write this? Because planning meetings, well, meetings are meetings, aren't they? Surely. They well, are. I'd like yeah, to take yeah. this and start with this one because Rich and I have done this before. So Rich had been writing uh, books with some other people, and I wanted to write a book but didn't know what to write about. And a and a friend of mine who actually he was uh, brought me into a local university to co-teach. He said, you do all these um, 
big meetings at pharmaceutical where you have two and three day planning meetings for projects. I said, yeah, he said, I would read that book. I thought, okay. So um, I figured, let me contact, we're trying to figure out, Rich has approached everybody to write a book except me. It's a lot of inclusion, of course, is Rich doesn't like me. But I called him up and it turned out he did like me, mostly. And I said, Rich, I have an idea for a book. It took me a while to, to not convince him, but to explain it. Once I did, he was on board. And then I was like, a little while ago. And then we went at it. We just treated it like a project. And I'd run a lot of big meetings. Rich has run big meetings. His maybe more on the telecom side, mine on the IT, and a lot, oddly, on the pharmaceutical side, because I have no pharma background, just sort of fell into it. And we just both felt like meetings can and should be run better. So we went from the, the, the macro to these big two or X day planning meetings down to the micro, the half hour status report meeting, uh, those type of meetings. We just felt and still feel that those can be run better. And I just want to say that in the in, in, to, to add to that, in the year and a half-ish that I've been working remotely, I've yet to have a meeting, not yet, but rarely had a meeting that started on time. Everybody comes from previous meetings where they say, my meeting ran over. And I'm thinking, that means because nobody's running it. So uh, um, my follow-up question, my follow -up question to, sorry, my follow-up question to that, my meeting ran over is always, what did it run over? Yeah. <laughs> they, they just a cat, yeah, they, a, a goat. <laughs> Go ahead, Jim. So every every meeting is like that. It's just sort of but anyway, that, that's what was the you asked what the derivation of how we started. That was the idea and we started working on it. That's right. And both of us were involved in these kickoff meetings um in telecom. You'd bring together, you know, I mentioned Verizon. So you'd bring together Verizon uh, project managers, Verizon executives, our company's executives and and engineers and installing installation supervisors, and we would convene for two or three days, sometimes first an internal meeting, then a meeting with the customer. And we got good at it. We actually got good at it um, through practice. And so we wanted to share some of the um, principles we found that work, both Jim and I, and, and these meetings that ended up being pretty successful, successful in that people left with a charged up feeling, they knew what to do. Um, they could, could kind of salute to the end game of you know what this project was all about. And, and although the book's title clumsily says it's about project planning, productive project planning meetings, um, I think that it also um, is a, a communications book. I mean, it covers communications in general. Meetings are, when you think about it, a form of communications, transferring information, right? Um, right? Everyone agree? Yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's a, I think it's... it's a, Critical that, it, especially these days, that's how we use it because it's it's it's, the, it's a. From my yeah. view, we, you've got um, a lot of communications one way, and meetings are the only ones you're getting where you've got that two way, real time, right. and it, real time two way yeah, communication. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, multi pair, multi pair wise. All right. So so it's it's a it is a book on communications, and we've actually. Um, parlayed that a little bit into communications workshops. So we've actually done that with a major telecom already. Um, and I don't want to make this an advertisement, but you know, by way of at least conveying the fact or communicating the fact that we have this, we, we realize that the, the book is about meetings. However, um, it uses that as one vehicle to explain why communications is so important in general. And some of the tips about communicating in general, although the focus in the book is on project planning meetings. And whereas Rich's meetings were with network people, mine of course were with um, uh, marketing people, regulatory people, you know, a big 10, 12, 14 year, I wasn't involved in the whole thing, project to develop a drug or a medical device. So those are the people that were coming together to do that. And of course, one of the things that happens too is, and I'm sure Rich could attest to this, is you're meeting to produce a specific set of deliverables. But then you have all these side discussions. And if you're in a world where you can bring people physically together, we brought people together from all over the world for these meetings, not only would they have dinner together and whatnot, but they would go from breakout sessions to discuss some technical thing, harmonization of drugs across, across the EU or whatever. They were kind of outside the scope of my world of project management, but well within their world and the marketing people. So they're all in one place. And this synergy happens, whatever you might want to call it. I think they call it some level osmotic communication where they're hearing each other talk and communicating. So there's a thing that happens over and above the project itself 
which is which is really nice. It happens better in person, I will say. You can do things remotely, but that type of communication happens better when they're when they're together. Okay. Well, sounds, sounds reasonable. If, so let's let's cut to the chase, and I'm guessing it's I, I, I haven't looked at how long a book it is. Um, uh, is it is it a three page? Is it a four, <laughs> four points? What are there four points that tell exactly what we do, or is it a bit more uh, complicated than that? What is it, 150 Jim? pages or so? I wish I had a copy. Yeah. Of it. I don't have one. <laughs> you know, I don't have one near me. Book and it's uh, maybe 150, 160 pages. Yeah, the problem is it, it keeps selling out. It keeps selling out and selling out. I have to sell my copy. Uh, so, uh, I'm kidding. Um, it's it's a paperback. It's a, a, I think it's roughly, I have to use English measurements here, uh, American now measurements. It's something like five inches by nine inches. Um, yeah. And it's about uh, three quarters of an inch thick paperback. E easy read. There's a, as you can tell from the two of us, there's a little bit of comedy and lightheartedness in it, although it's a very serious topic. Um, so we made it an easy read. And the other thing I'd say about it is it's got a little bit of a, Jim, tell me if I'm wrong, kind of threaded through it is kind of an introduction to project management, because we talk about what is a WBS and how does that fit into things. So you actually mm -hmm. learn, it's not, it's not meant to be an intro to PM book. So right. We don't want to falsely advertise it, but we have written it so that, you know, like as a refresher, I think we had a refresher chapter in there and we take you through some of the fundamentals of projects themselves. It's kind of built into the book. Right. And we use things like a house, we use a greenhouse, if I recall correctly, uh, energy efficient house. As yeah, we, have some what we, do. we have some examples in there. One of the other things I just want to make sure we get out there since we've talked about the pandemic and Zoom and so forth. Um, is that we we wrote the book pre-COVID, yeah. before the pandemic. Um, however, we were, I don't know, uh, smart enough. I don't know if that's the right word, but we are lucky maybe enough to include a chapter by uh, Wayne Termell. And I don't know if you know that name. Wayne wrote the book, The Long Distance Leader. Wayne and uh, I think Kevin Eikenberry, his partner, wrote a second book also about the long distance team member. Um, and he shared uh, a chapter with us about virtual meetings. So we, we actually have that aspect in there. It's not tied to COVID, but we now all, like it or not, have become, um, you know, great, we call them Brady Bunch meeting members, you know, with the people, people all over the screen. And, and we, we, um, we were lucky enough to have him give uh, some comments about uh, and advice particularly about how to do these kinds of meetings virtually. Yeah, and that was pre-popularity of Zoom. Were we to do another edition that we could expand that chapter because there's so much to say. I happen to be writing a, a blog post for somebody right now, uh, and it's about running agile retrospectives remotely. And it isn't just about that. It's about, you know, what are the issues? Like we talk about Zoom fatigue, which is, it happens. But also if you're running a retrospective remotely, what are the issues in doing that very thing? So I think if we were to expand it, it would still be the same book, but maybe a longer chapter, a couple of chapters in remote because it's such a big deal now where it was just sort of, we were talking about uh, Skype and WebEx. Now we'd incorporate Zoom, screenshots of that maybe, and discussions about how best to do that. We also have a chapter on Agile because it's a waterfall-based book. I think it's easy to say, fair to say, but we wanted to bring some flavor of Agile. So we had somebody else, uh, it was Steve uh, Martin, his name, believe it or not. He wrote a chapter for us on on Agile, which is a topic. I, now I could have written that chapter. It was on scaled Agile. Yeah, but, Jim, um, Jim was Jim, when Jim was talking about having more hair and more certifications. He was a little shy about saying a lot of those certifications are in the area of Agile, and he I looked to him as uh, as an expert. Um, you know, the water has already fallen behind me, as you see, um, okay. and so I'm a waterfall guy, but I'm very open to and have as much as possible been bringing Agile even into my courses where we develop uh, our projects iteratively, not in the full sense of the, not in the full Agile sense of the word, but we, you know, the students will provide a, um, after the first week, they'll provide a presentation on what they, you know, what they have so far. And so the principles are there, but I still need to learn a lot from uh, the gentleman on my- Other side. That side, <laughs> that way. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting because I think the, the both the remote and the agile points that you made there it's something that 
I personally, I think, is in the last two, three years, the uh, impact of both of those, obviously COVID's driven the one, Agile's, but the impact of Agile is, is, is accelerating. Um, yeah. I think you, you, the, as you alluded to there, it's the use of the Agile tools, if not necessarily the full, full Agile-ness, um, is something that I've seen um, quite a lot, and I've done it myself, where I've, I've used, I know where we have a piece of work, and it's kind of like, well, let's just use the same tools, let's use the same, the retrospectives and things like that, because it's all good communication meetings, aren't they? At the mm -hmm. end of the day, that's what they are. They're all about structure around some communication. That's all, all it is, and it's a different way of doing it and a different way of signposting it and reporting on it. It's about Which, radiating information, if I understand it correctly. Correct. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think, I, I, I wonder when talking about the remote working, if we think about the facilitating a, a, a project planning meeting in the traditional sense where you have um, everyone in the same geolocation, everyone available and everyone comes to that meeting. I'm not sure how often have you guys, I know you've said like you've had some big meetings, how often have you had the situation where you've got at least one person who is not there because they've not been able to, but maybe you've got 20 people in, in specific location and another person's on the other side of the world and not getting them across um, and getting them involved with those meetings is difficult. So you, we've always had that kind of micro remote, very rare that we would, there would always be a, a, a core group of people that kind of sat together and had those meetings, you know, my experience anyway, but then you had a few, maybe someone on a conference call, which invariably what I've found is they'd be on the conference call and you, you in the room, forget about them right even to the point where you say right should we have a break yeah let's have a break okay let's have a break and the, they're like we just walk out and and and, and wayne, wayne actually <laughs> wayne actually addressed that in, in the chapter he talked about you know not having them necessarily in you uh asking for their opinion for whatever those type of things making sure that the room knows that that person is there make them feel a full member of it and now they can be on video theoretically, right? It's changed it because video before was very expensive in the Zoom world. It's no big deal to have them up on the screen. So I would that's what I would say. They can have, be up on the screen as much as they want or have that room up. Very often it's two or three people like that. And then they're up there and they're a full member of the thing. And you know, if you're if I was working in Boston and my team is in India, which is very common, or I could ship them back and forth, we bring them up and we become a full member of the team. You're right. If you forget about them, that's gonna happen. But you have to be very con you have to be more cautious in a remote arrangement, I think. Much more aware. Yeah. I mean it's very easy to think of that person as a polycom speaker yeah. as opposed to as opposed to a human being. And like you said, I, I have been on both sides of that. I've been in the I've probably been the careless person who said, Okay, let's take a break. And the polycom is is doing, I mean it's not actually doing this, but it's like, what? You know, and, and I've also uh, also been that person who's been remote. My, I worked for many, many years as uh, the only person in Massachusetts when uh, our company became a little bit more worldwide. Our, a lot of our folks were in Texas and Finland and, and India, and they would do that to me. And it's like, it, it's denigrating. It feels, you feel like a third or fourth class citizen. You haven't even made it to second class. <laughs> yeah, and it's quite difficult in those scenarios when you are on the end of that phone to sometimes be heard because whilst you can raise your voice um, in, in the room, you can gesture yeah, and, right. uh, or, or with the video, you can do that and go, God, video makes a big I've difference. got something yeah. to say. Um, but that's, that's exactly it. Our book talks about if you're running a meeting, if Rich and I are running a meeting, we're running that meeting. It's not the responsibility of the person on the other side. It's our responsibility to say, Mary has some, a point to make, or Mary, what do you think? It's up to Rich and I running that meeting because it's not exactly. her fault if she can't get the voice. In. Exactly. And and Jim Jim was, I think, really clear in the book, uh, in the parts he wrote about the fact that you you want to be people's friends and you need to make good, have good relationships with, with people. But when you're running the meeting, you sometimes have to be the bad guy. You have right. to say, OK, um, you know, this talks to the goblins we can we can speak about, but um, you have to you have to say, even at the risk of temporarily hurting a relationship, um, which is a little controversial, you have to say, 
okay, this is not the topic of the meeting, or we have to listen to, you know, Karen, who's on the speakerphone. Um, you know, you have you have to direct the meeting. You you own it. You own the meeting as a project manager. In fact, one of the points we make is that, <laughs> kind of ironically, we're project managers, but we forget that running a two or three day planning meeting is, guess what, a project. <laughs> that means we can put the same, we can and should put the same rigor um, and attention and focus on an end goal, which is a su successful meeting that we put on our, you know, new drug or new pharmaceutical project uh, product or our new uh, widget or new service. Well, we make the point that you have to be larger than charge if you're running a meeting. This is getting down to the crux of the book and not to be wor too worried about being liked. And I don't mean that in the sense of people want to be like, well, I'll let Bob here ramble over 20 minutes so he'll like me. Meanwhile, the other people are looking at you with daggers, as we say, because you're not controlling that. So I was on a, I'm coaching a woman right now as a project manager at this DC company. And I listened in on the calls and she was saying to me, you know, those meetings run over because they keep talking. And I'm saying, yeah, they keep talking because you're not stopping them. Meetings don't, <laughs> meetings don't run themselves. So people come away from a meeting and say, well, that was a waste of time. Who was running it? I was. Well, we didn't get to the agenda. Well, whose fault is it? So it's really the person running it that has to make sure. So I'm speaking to the person running the meeting of the people attending the meeting. If you're the person listening to me right now, you run that meeting, you're large and in charge. Don't worry about being light. You're running it. If you don't get to the agenda, you can't get home at night, complain to your spouse. I couldn't get through everything in my meeting it, it, unless it was a good reason because you had to circumvent it. You're running it. It's not running itself. That's kind of a heart and soul of our book in a lot of ways. That's right. It's, um, People still seem to be aware of that. Surprising. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it, it's something that's, that's always occurred to me with, with um, running big workshops, running meetings is um, you, you say when you and Rich are running one, it's that concept where I've, I've done it before where it's you forget how exhausting mm. facilitating something like that can be, especially if you're running it over a day, a long right. day, or maybe two days, mm -hmm. and having two of you to be able to go right, I'm facilitate because quite often as a PM, I don't know about you guys find this, it's you you can't facilitate and contribute right at the same time because it, you, you're the the energy that you need and the the attention that you need to do those because you can be the well I know I talk for England so it's I can be the culprit that could keep the thing running if I'm starting to talk without someone stopping me talking um, and I don't what do you think on that is the fact that you've got that dynamic between one it's energy levels for you but having multiple facilitators swapping over and having that um uh, distinction between when you are contributing and when you are running the meeting you want to take a shot rich and then i'll follow up yeah i think we mentioned in the book that you know that you might consider if it's a really big important kickoff meeting you might consider having another person a deputy or a, a, even a trained facilitator uh, run the meeting so that you can contribute as the as the project manager. You're right. It you, it's it's a it's a very very talented and multifaceted person that can be running the meeting and contributing to the meeting. They're different things, and it is exhausting, especially over over multiple days, to keep that kind of attention and going out of your personality, which might be more wanting to get people to to agree and like you to to be on the very extroverted, assertive side and say, no, nope, enough of that, Jim, uh, Bob or Bill or Karen, you, we, we, this is off topic. Um, yeah. that's, that can be very exhausting depending on your personality type too. And in addition, um, I actually, I haven't told Rich about this. One of the places I teach for periodically offers us classes. They offer us a one day class in facilitation. I just took it last week. And as a facilitator, you can often maybe should be neutral. Your job is to facilitate and pull things out. So if I was the project manager on a large, uh, working for a, a pharmaceutical, running a project, maybe I do want to bring a facilitator so she can facilitate while I contribute. But the reason for having two isn't necessarily just because of that. So when I was working at the farmers, and I use that as my one big example, the woman that brought me in to do those, she was a great facilitator, Rich knows her too. And, uh, and she would facilitate 
while I was doing something else. So we could divide and conquer. So for example, since we're our project managers, we would be having work breakdown structures up on the wall. And I would be visiting different groups discussing the work breakdown structure, regulatory, marketing, et cetera, while she was visiting other groups. The second day of our meeting, I'd be going around with my laptop collecting information on the Microsoft project while she was leading a breakout group in harmonization of the drug across the EU, or she might've been running a risk thing. So Rich and I were doing it together. Two things about that. One, we might define our roles going in. I do this, Rich does that. But the other important thing would might be by 11 o'clock in the morning of day one, Rich might say, why don't you do X and I'll do Y? Because we're shifting, as the Agile say, respected and adapted. And it turned out maybe Rich should be doing this, or I should be doing that, or we shift it. So the other thing I learned from the facilitator, she was, I saw her once tear up the agenda at 10 o'clock in the morning. What are you doing? The, the ground has shifted underneath us for this reason, and we're going to modify it. So you have to be able to shift at roles and whatnot. But I think if you're going to have a couple of day meeting, if I had one of these now, Rich were free, I'd call him up and say, you want to co-facilitate with me? And, it's, and as we talked about, it's in the planning. Boy, you got to plan. Yeah. And, and you have to plan. And I love that idea of tearing up the agenda because everyone who's at the meeting when it starts to go like this and it's on a totally different tangent, Right. Um, is saying they're saying to themselves, whether you know it or not, they're saying, so this isn't I mean, this isn't what we're supposed to be talking about. This is a whole different topic. If the leader of the meeting publicly and consciously tears up the agenda and says, OK, we it's much more important for us to talk about X. We were going to talk about Y, but we're going to talk about X because it's it's the elephant in the room. It's the urgent thing we have to talk about. I would, as an attendee, <laughs> I would appreciate that much more than just sitting there going, I wish we were talking about X, uh, Y, or whatever I said. I wish we were talking about Y. Why are we talking about X? Now the leader says, we're talking about X, and here's why. It's 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 important, it's urgent, and it's it's affecting our jobs. So we have to talk about X. And I would much rather see that leadership from a, a project manager, from a facilitator, than, than having everyone in the room running a little subroutine that says, why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about this? Mm -hmm. So it's kind it, of- it, it may be you plan a meeting for Monday and Tuesday, and on Friday, the planning was done Monday, and one of your team comes in and says, over the weekend, our product failed in XYZ situation. All of a sudden, it changes this. We have to sort of not cancel this two-day meeting, but shift some of the focus there. You have to be nimble in that respect, I think. And another point to make is, and Rich and I, I think we bring this out in the book, if you can't run this big two-day meeting and you're the guy or gal running the project, you're going to go away and say, this guy can't run a meeting. He's going to run my multi-year project. Yeah. So you're setting a tone with this meeting in a large respect. They're, they're a similar skill set. And the other thing you haven't mentioned, Rich and I have both been teaching for years. There's a lot of there's a lot of herding cats in teaching because there's always somebody in the room that wants to have a side conversation. Yeah. While he's having the side conversation, you have a choice. You can let him have that, stop him, or let have it for a little while. And I opt for the sort of I'll let him have it for a little while. I say, hey, Fred, very interesting, but that's a side topic. You might think he might say, um, you know, well, I want to talk about this. Very often I say, oh, yeah, yeah, I tend to do that. I tend to, do, and they get back, and we'll talk about it offline. So Rich and I, by teaching, have learned a lot about running meetings. Which are not meetings exactly, but are in a sense, because they're crowd control. Yeah. yeah. I think the point, the point that you made um, uh, before there about it being like a project, I can't remember which one of you just said that, but that, and I, I sort of popped in my head, is that if you're running a project and, six month project and three months into the project you identify that the actual outcome of the project you're about to deliver is not valid to the organization shouldn't be done it's going to cost 10 times as much soon what are you going to do you're going to change that project you're going to go to the stakeholders and go right this has happened right. what are we going to do and that's the same right. with the meeting the same yeah. same with the agenda it's just at a, at a quicker uh time together isn't it exactly when one example, on again, with this company that Rich and I know, I, they, they do all life sciences work. Um, I went out to, I think it was California. Yeah, California. And this woman and I were doing this project together. And we asked people, what are your specific requirements for this medical device? And you could hear a pin drop. And so we realized they hadn't fleshed it out. So she pulled a guy in from Oregon who was a requirements guy, one of her guys. 
he worked on gathering requirements while we did the rest of the meeting. It was, we just, or else if he hadn't been available, we would have done that. Now, why didn't we know that? I'm not really sure. Maybe we thought we knew the requirements, but that's where we were, so. The, the dynamics of a meeting aren't that uh, really a microcosm to use a very fancy word they're a microcosm of a project and that's one of the things we realized and one of the reasons i got interested in writing the book is that was an aha moment a meeting is a project and although we're pretty good at running projects we forget to run the meeting like a project and to lead it like a project manager and, and to make the changes now the example you just used nigel is kind of interesting because a lot of project managers three months into a six month project, the project's not delivering what it's supposed to, it's not connected to the objectives of the organization. We are kind of, you know, there are some project managers, I won't name names, who will say, must finish project. They'll still do it, right? Um, it's more of a, it's, 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 yeah, it's more of a, a portfolio manager's mindset that would say, we have to stop this project. The project manager might say to themselves, I don't want to lose my job. The project is my job. Therefore, I must keep the project alive, even though it's killing the company. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a hard decision to make, isn't it? In, in yeah. that, to turn around and go, hang on, I just spent three months. I don't know doing has been wasted. Yes. The same, the, same in the meeting. We've just yep. spent two days. I've just wasted two days of your time because we are looking at the wrong thing. It's difficult. And, yep. and quite often someone will take that. The, the easier path of let the meeting run, do all that stuff at the end of it, and then deal with it later. And then there's another kickoff for the real project later, isn't it? Right, right. But Jim's point is extremely important. So I'm going to say it again. And that's this idea that you, when you're up there um, running a meeting, doing it, let's, let's take the positive, doing a fantastic job with the running of the meeting as a project, whether people ex experience it that way or not. What, what they're saying to themselves is this man or woman, I trust them to run the project. Unfortunately, the opposite is true. You know, if, if you're doing a really lousy job running the meeting, you have not built confidence in your project team members that you'll be the right person to, to carry this forward. We're talking kickoff meetings. Now, again, our book goes through all different kinds of meetings. We focus on kickoff meetings because that very reason, that's where you make your first impression. So can I ask you a daft question, both of you? And then just give me a one sentence answer from each of you. When should you have your project kickoff meeting? <laughs> I will defer to Rich. I want to hear what he has to say. <laughs> when should you have your project kickoff meeting? Um, you can't have it when the project is conceived because there's not enough knowledge. So um, I just need to make this one sentence. Uh, after the major work streams are defined, I'll try to limit after the major work streams have been defined. And Jim, I would, I would agree, and I would add to that after you have a charter, because until you have a charter, you don't have a project. Once you have a charter, that, that's the way it should be. You have a written charter, it's signed off on, then you can have a kickoff meeting. But a very waterfall a, answer. A very waterfall. No, answer. actually, no, because the yeah, because that's a mis misunderstanding is that that there's no documentation. Not that there's is. no documentation, but what about a yeah. charter? Charter? Yes. Yeah, I, I would still have one in Azure if I possibly could. Yeah. Good. I don't know what the equivalent would be otherwise. Maybe it would be they'd have their sprint zero first. But if I can have a charter on a project, I'm going to have a charter. I, the mistake in Azure sometimes we, we throw out the everything from waterfall and say it's not relevant, but charter is very relevant. Exactly. This is my contention that, that I think both of these camps are really much more alike than they think. There's some things that are very different, but there's much more alike than they think. And there's really no need for a uh, a third world war here. Be quite, my, my view on this, and I've said it to many people before, is that um, we have two tools in project management that we talk about most of the time. One is a hammer, one is a screwdriver. One is agile, one is waterfall. If right. you're building a cabinet, you're using both. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know what I mean? You've got, it's, not, it's not about either or, it's when to use which. And, and, and some of the tools are coming, I'm, I'm reviewing for my customer, some software tools. Uh, one of them is a is a scheduler online. Said, look what we've added in the Gantt chart. So I mean, you know, <laughs> okay. Exactly. So what's what's happening is the agilists are now that they're becoming more mature with it, and they're you know are saying, okay, maybe there is some good stuff in that. I, I think a watershed. I'm going to get a little off topic here. Is when PMI 
fully adopted Agile as in six, the Agile practice guide. And as Rich knows, probably in seven, he's seen seven, I haven't, Pinbox seven, even more so. And the exam through PMI is 50% Agile. So with PMI giving its blessing, it, the, the Agile manifesto now being here for 20 years, we have to be able to go towards either one. And there's a lot of meetings in, by the way, in, uh, in Agile, there's a daily standup, which your scrum master has to keep to 15 minutes. There's a sprint review, there's a planning meeting, there's a retrospective. These are all meetings that happen. So the, the same rules still apply. Good meeting running is, you know, when people talk about stuff in Agile, what do we do with a person who isn't good on a team? What, do you, what have you ever done? You coach that person. If that can't be done, you write that person up through HR. If not, they move on someplace to another organization. So it isn't like we throw out all the rules from Waterfall to Agile. There's still common sense in there, I hope, somewhere. But there's still a lot of meetings in that. So that's why we, we wrote a chapter in Agile. We had it written because the meetings Rich and I are talking about are large two- and three-day planning meetings. In scaled Agile, safe, they have two-day planning meetings called PI meetings. So we figured, well, we show an analogy there. So it, it isn't really an agile book per se. And maybe again, if we have another version of our, our book would have been a bigger bestseller, but we had one thing against it. It came out the same day as Michelle Obama's book and she just collaborated. That's right. She just collaborated with her. It did. Sale. And we, we wrote to her and complained about that. How <laughs> you dare you? Talk to the same How people dare here. you? <laughs> So since, let's, let's, before we, if we're going to, I don't know if we're going to end, we may never end, but because we didn't establish an end time to our meeting, no, but um, before we end, I do want to talk about goblins. Jim, Jim knows I will never do these interviews without letting our of goblins course. loose. Do your thing. So I'd like to talk about meeting goblins. One of the things we, we, we did in this book is we talked to a lot of people, a lot of uh, bruised, battered, bleeding people uh, who've been at a lot of meetings and suffered with them, a lot of people our age and, believe it or not, even older, um, and ask them, you know, what was it, what were some of the things you experienced in meetings that you liked, didn't like, and so forth, and we, we logged this, and one thing that came out pretty common was this idea that these nasty people, or people at least, who are acting nasty at our meetings, and it came down to, we found six meeting participants, you'll recognize them, um, you have your own names for them, but we, for example, one of them, I'm just going to talk about one, Nancy Naysayer. So you have this person at a meeting, that'll never work. You can't do that. That's impossible. You know, um, we tried that last week, didn't work. We, uh, the, you, know, the, you know, the Johnson project, that, that fell on his face and it tried that too. Doesn't work, won't work. Ever heard, heard that person? Oh, yeah. I've been, I'll, I'll hold my hands up. I've been that person sometimes. You've been that person. Okay, so if you're in a meeting and you're doing that, no, what, does that what does that do to the spirit of the meeting? You're trying to kick it off after all, right? We're starting this project and there's someone going, won't work, nah, won't work. And sometimes they're muttering it to the person next to them, but you overhear it. So it's, it's not a positive for your meeting. So how do you deal with this person? So for all of these six different types, we have Garrelis, Gary, and we have uh, um, Nancy Naysayer, and we have Tina, the tangent taker, which we, by the way, we've all done in this meeting. <laughs> um, we, we have a little kind of a paragraph uh, on what you do with them. And just as an example, for Nancy Naysayer, this, you actually need this person, right? Nigel, we should have called it, and we should have called it Nigel Naysayer. We need you. We, we need you, but we need you for risk identification. So what you do is you acknowledge that person. You say, you know, Nigel, you're absolutely right. Can you hold that thought? We're going to have a section on identifying threats um, at 2:30. Can uh, can you kind of think of all those things? Because we do want to capture all these things that we want to be careful about. And there's a particular time when we're going to really need your talent. Yeah. So you've now acknowledged the person, let them know they're important. Because sometimes these people are not necessarily you, Nigel, but sometimes these people, why are they doing that? They want attention. Look at me. You know, I'm knowledgeable. I can talk about failed projects. Um, it's not the main intent, but that might be part of what's driving that behavior. So how can you thwart it? Um, Boy, I never thought I'd use the word thwart today. Anyway, how do you thwart that? You, you, you acknowledge them and you tell them there is going to be a time for that to be very, very valuable, but not now. I mean, that's part of the message is not now. 
So, but part of the drivers of that person's behaviour may be that they raised these concerns before. I know. I, I, yeah, exactly. And they've been ignored or been, and, and they've raised them and raised them and raised them and raised them and continue to get. I know I had one project where we were. We had a number of the teams that were at war. <laughs> they were different organizations and I'd come into there and they were at war with each other essentially. And we got a session together and we got everyone in the room. And with one person who was particularly um, falling into that camp, but they got the chance to talk about the problems that they had. And then you can turn it around there and say, yeah, yeah we get recognized that's a risk. What do you think the solutions are to those risks? And they knew all the solutions to all of the issues they were raising, but they needed someone to listen to them and acknowledge and agree to do those solutions. But they weren't being listened to with what the problem was. And that's where that could drive from. Yeah. So again, it's just a matter of stepping up, like Jim says, being large and in charge. Um, and and, and it, it, it might not be your normal personality to say, Nancy, you know, Nancy Naysayer, this is not the time to mention that. Is that just against your, you want to just let them go because they seem to want the floor. So I'll be nice and let them talk. But like Jim says, everyone else in the room is saying, why are we talking about all these risks now? We have a section on risk management at 2.30. And, and, and not only that, but looking at you, but something just occurred to me, Rich, that I hadn't even thought of before. Uh, my wife is a school teacher. And these are grade school kids and often special needs kids. She doesn't sit there and say, oh, Bobby's running out in the street, but in order for him to like me, I'm going to let him run out in the middle of the street. Because Bobby, you get back, she grabs him, pulls him in. Or Nancy, stop misbehaving. So is there a certain aspect that we have rich of this as being, I don't demean the people coming to the meeting, where a part of us has to be that third grade school teacher saying, now, Nancy, don't do that. Now, Bobby, you know, in a way. There's a flavor in a of way, that. Just I wouldn't express it quite that way, but, right, but yeah, it's, it's yeah. the same. Right, it's the exact same. It's the exact same thing for the benefit yeah. of your own health and the health of the, the group. We yeah. need to change what we're doing right now, and right. and, and express. That's a real challenge for a project manager. That's um, you know, more on the um, agreeable, uh, spectrum. Uh, right. than the one that's on the assertive side of the spectrum. Yeah, assertive is the word. You know. That's it really, it really connects to um, the last uh, guest that just came out um, uh, as we're recording this. This Hobbs, who I interviewed, uh, talking about the DISC uh, behavioural model. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, where, yep. you've got, where you have the, the four different types of behaviours. And, yep. and you're obviously going to have people in your meetings that are going to behave like that in different ways, but also you as your own behaviour style is going to default, as you say, if you are more of a... Uh, um, a person, a people person, and you don't want to fall out with them and things like that. But it, and then the grade school teacher thing kind of comes in where the example I've always used for those disc things where you've got the four um, character traits, where you've got the if your child steps out into the road, you shout, you get them onto off the road, they burst into tears. Fine. So what you do is when they burst into tears, you drop down into the other type of your own different behavior you nurture them you give them a hug and just let them cry and then you wonder I say, let's go and get some ice cream let's have some fun you become the fun high eye and then you get there with the ice cream and as you sat down and you calm down you sit there and you talk through why you shouted and you dragged them there and you kind mm -hmm. of that goes through those four and and we all step into those different behavior styles and those different tools in a blink of an eye in certain circumstances and in those meetings, the same self -awareness. thing. Yep. Yeah. Self-awareness. Yeah. Self-awareness is important. And just as you said, being a, I like to say being a chameleon, whichever whichever behavior model, I mean, that disc is a good one. So I'm, I'm starting to learn how to use the social styles, the um, the ask, tell, the one that ends up with expressives and directives, very, actually quite similar to disc. Um, but the, the number one trait, and Jim and I have both taught this for a long time, whether you're talking about Thomas Kilman conflict modes or, or uh, Myers Briggs, the, the number one, the number one behavior isn't any of those behaviors. It's the ability to be a chameleon and yeah. jump around between those, um, because you're going to need those different um, that that added the different attitudes at different times. And, and like Jim said, third grade teacher may not be a formal uh, American Society of Psychological Studies um, personality type, but I think it should be third grade. Third grade 
teacher should be. Now, but here's an interesting thing that your viewers or listeners might ask, and it's a fair question. What if the, pe the person disrupting the meeting is several levels above you and everybody else? You would challenge if it's the vice president or the sponsor or somebody, right? So our answers aren't as easily, you know, what, what I've done in some situations is if I know very often the people who are the executives, let's say they might be very talkative, they might be passionate about it. And I might visit that executive beforehand and say, without saying it, I really need to keep this meeting focused and I need to keep moving along like this. And they might say, yeah, I tend to go off. Can I, can I you know, bring you back home? If, if that happens, can I bring you back? Yeah, do that. So if you can get around that person going in, it's a larger problem, isn't it, Rich, if the gremlin or the goblin is somebody who's several levels above everybody and we can't necessarily control their behavior. Absolutely. You have a bully CEO and, and yeah. they're, they're Nancy Naysayer or they're Tina Tangent um, or Gary Garrelis. Um, a little harder to rein in. I mean, let's be honest, it's going to be harder to rein them in. Yeah. But, you know, it's one of those situations where you're going to take that risk and say, let's say the person's name is uh, Henry. Henry, uh, I mean, we have to get back to the meeting. Now, he, he in this case, it's a he, may say, this is not a yes man. This is a person who knows how, knows what they're doing, or right. they, <laughs> depending on their behavior, they might just have you go. But at that point, it's probably better to be out of that company. Right. That's yeah. that's been my experience. Is, uh, is that the people who've stepped up and and talked the truth to power in those cases, um, and then actually were let go, are the happiest people I know now. Because they found a, their own, they found another job. They found a different company that was more uh, that where, where there was more respect. Uh, and by the way, in that example, and I can't name names, the, the, that that VP who was the bully was um, was arrested on a DUI and is back in his home country. He was visiting the U.S. And the other person is now running a nonprofit um, sustainability company in New York, and he is he's one of the happiest people I know. So I think that's a that's a story for another day. I think part of it is is doing your homework as you as a facilitator. You're coming in from the first of all, if you're an employee, you know the personalities involved. If you're coming as an outside facilitator, you start doing your homework and interviewing people. You'll find out that Ted will say is a loud mouth or whatever it might be, and yeah, they might say something like, "Just let him go a little bit, and he'll calm down." You might get a way to understand a way to handle him. You might meet with him one on one and say. Uh, we have this meeting, we have to accomplish these goals. You made the fact of extra time for this guy to blow off steam, right? Not not a Ted blow off steam time, but you have to acknowledge that maybe this day and a half meeting will be two days because there's going to be some going off the rails, but you can't force a senior executive to do anything. Just, those are outside of what we can make happen. Like Rich even said, he cut right to the chase. Sometimes you don't last at that company and you don't want to. Well, it's stakeholder management, isn't it? It's like you say, again, with the analogy of the fact that you've got a project, a planning meeting, and meeting is a project. Mm. You prepare for meetings by getting to know the attendees, and that's stakeholder management. It's the same as you do. And sometimes you have stakeholders you can manage, sometimes you have stakeholders you can't manage, and sometimes stakeholders turn up that you didn't know existed. And you have that with meetings as well. Mm. Very yeah, and you, yes, should, exactly. you, should, you should know them. A classic example I want to give you is, the DC company I'm working with is a woman that runs the company. She's great, she's nice, she's got a million customers, she's doing a good job. But I found out recently that one of her stakeholders uh, in, this, in this healthcare initiative they're doing, he's a difficult guy and he'll call and text her at home at 11 o'clock at night. And she'll her husband will say, don't answer it. And she'll take the call. And I would just say, if you put me in that position, I, when he called, I'd say, Thank you. Don't call me at 11 o'clock at night unless it's an emergency. She's incapable of doing that. Even though she's tough enough to build a company, she isn't a server enough in some ways to say to this guy, don't call me at 11 o'clock at night. And when he does call her, half the time it's just some nonsense thing. Nobody should put up with that. It's her company. <laughs> she's a CEO. <laughs> one, one, one point to, to make here that, that came up, and I don't want it to kind of at one point that came up, I think that's kind of important to note that goes back to the book is there's nothing wrong, going back to third grade here, there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with homework before a meeting. Right. One of the things that we find is very wasteful at meetings is that during the meeting, people are learning, they're, they're reading about the, the network in our case, right? You're building a network and they're just, they're reading about it at the meeting. 
come to the meeting prepared. And it's fair for you to ask your attendees to say, we're going to have this planning meeting. Please come after having read this, you know, three page. Don't give them, you know, it's not also fair to have them read, you know, a, you know, a, a, a giant contract or a treatise on, on some, you know, major new, new development um, in, in telecom. But there's nothing wrong with having them read an executive summary and say, I, we expect you to have read this uh, at the meeting. That's that's a that's a good thing because people can talk intelligently instead of saying, well, what I'm reading here now for the first time, they won't say the first time part. What I'm reading now here is that this is a 26 node network. Well, if you read down later, it's actually a 12 node network, right? So it, like, <laughs> you should know that in advance. Yeah. But, but if we're good facilitators, Rich, and you know this, no matter what homework we give them, half the people do won't do it until last or they ever. Do so yeah, be, maybe we give them a presentation in the beginning. So what happened a lot of the farmer ones, when we came in, each one of the people, regulatory, manufacturing, gave their own little bit of a presentation up front. And there was homework for them to do. And we would present everything. If they came in woefully unprepared, well, very often the sponsor was there and that would speak for itself. The sponsor's gonna be at the meeting. Do you really wanna come in unprepared? Sometimes we use that leverage to make sure. I, I think in a meeting of the size, correct me if I'm wrong, Rich, you're gonna have your sponsor there or somebody pretty senior. Yes, that first and, and that, that, first that does meeting. that does cure a lot of evils. Um, Tends to crystallize people's minds a lot when the big big boys and big girls are there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. So, I think we've kind of come to it. We've been going nearly three quarters of an hour now, I think. And um, yeah. I was going to just ask, to wrap up, really, what would you say are the key things that obviously the book the book's available, guys. Grab the book. I'm sure that. Um, uh, uh, both Jim and Rich are going to be excited for you to buy copies of their book. Um, <laughs> can, yes, can I share the screen, Rich? Can you let me share the screen while he's saying this? I, have a picture uh, I would. I would like you to share the screen, and only partially because I'm tired of looking at you. Only, only right. partially. You <laughs> only partially. Whenever, you're, whenever you're ready. <laughs> yeah. I can't. I can't, Rich. You have it disabled. Oh, that's because I really do like looking at you. What can I say? All right, hold on a sec. Here All we right. go. Go ahead. Uh, here. Now you can share. There's our book. It's available at all the leading bookstores and even yeah. a few of the crummy ones. <laughs> so just, well, I'm seeing that on there. So if you want to just give a, um, a quick, what are the key topics that you think would, people would benefit from grabbing the book, copying the book? Go ahead, Rich. I'll take a shot. At, I'll take a shot at that. So first of all, it, it does have this project management refresher. So if you just wanted a really, and you can tell from listening to us, kind of lighthearted view of, um, you know, project management, looking through this book will, will help you. But it's, it's, it's really a communications book uh, uh, focused on meetings. And it has what I think are practical tips on how to run a meeting, including a whole chapter on war stories with some real yeah. actual stories um, from, I don't know, 10 or 15 people about real things Un unbelievable until you know these are real things that happen at meetings. So um, that's a quick digest. It's an easy read. When you're done with the book, the bottom line is when you're done with the book, you will run better meetings. Yeah. Jim, uh, Just the things that we talked about, the heart and soul, if, if you go through it, look, we're not getting rich off this book. Well, I am because I managed to do a contract where I'm getting 90% of the royalties and which gets 10, but that's the first time he's learned that. But if you read this book. Negotiation skills. <laughs> uh, we would like to point you to our websites as well, if, if, if we're at that point where we're doing Well, let me just finish what I was going to say, which is that it, the, the key things there are, it, people really need to learn how to run meetings better. And there are times I want to fly to every company in the country, if not the world, or as many as I can, and just say, you could have better meetings and better projects as a result of better meetings. So many people ignore the basics. Let's give you the basics and then some. So that's all. Yeah. So we do have a website. Um, I don't know if you have that up on. Uh, we can put that up no, on the chat. chat or put it in the chat. <laughs> I don't know if you see chat. If I chat, do you see it? I think you do. It's a uh, project meetings. Dot us. Oh yeah. Project, yeah. Project meetings. Dot us. Brilliant. And so that's uh, details about the book and how people can get all the book and stuff. Yeah, the book is available on Amazon and, okay. and um, you know, uh, from the publisher, which is, um, 
uh, Maven House, Maven House Press. So if you go to Maven House Press, M-A-V-E-N-H-O-U-S-E, mavenhousepress.com, you'll find our book is uh, featured there. But um, it's just as easy to find it on Amazon. Um, and uh, it's it it does okay. It's it's not it is not um, um, what's the what's Michelle? It's not Michelle Obama's book, but it was it does share one thing with it published on the same day. Correct. Brilliant. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, have a brilliant rest of your day. Thanks a lot. We'll Thanks do the you. best we can. Thank you very much, okay. and uh, it's been a pleasure to be here. Take care.